and welcome to our virtual teaching talk with centers that are gonna share uh, a strategy that's working very well in their class and they can see positive results with their students. Hey there, so I'm Heidi Richter in biology, uh, full-time faculty there, although I was adjunct before. Uh, I was asked to talk to you about alternative assessments because I am not known for doing multiple choice exams in a regular classroom, let alone doing them online, right? So um, we all know we have to assess. Uh, and the reason why we have to assess is to figure out are the goals of education being met? But what do those assessments look like? That's really up in the air based on the instructor, right? We know they should be based on learning outcomes and objectives. And hopefully in your courses, those are objectives are defined, although in some courses they're not, right? So while we have this list of objectives, can we make the way we assess those objectives more flexible than just doing a multiple choice test? And in a classroom, I have no problem doing that. But having never taught online, and one of the reasons I don't do it is because I personally struggle with developing exams that assess content heavy classes. So I teach biology. Um, we're not known for, you know, uh, not going through a lot of content in our courses. Our students will tell you on our student evaluations that we cover more content than any class they've ever seen before, every quarter. I also have no idea how to make an assessment, like an exam that can be completed in a given amount of time. I still, I can't find any research on it. There is no formula on how to figure out how long you should give to answer a question on a test where they have enough time to answer the question, but not enough time that they also can't just Google the answer, right? And how do you write questions that you can't just Google where they can't cheat, but also require critical thinking, right? It's, I have never been able to really figure this out. And that's one of the reasons, honestly, why I don't teach online. And I still didn't know how to do that when we swapped in spring quarter. So what I wanted to do was build in some flexibility in my courses to assess the course outcomes. So I'm going to talk to you about two classes I taught in spring. One was Environmental Science 150, which is Puget Sound Ecology. And the other one is Marine Biology, Biology 150. So in Environmental Science, we have a course outcome, identify representatives of the major phyla of organisms in Puget Sound ecosystems and their role in their communities. So I know I have to get this content across. When we meet in the classroom, students, they don't know any of their plants. So usually I make them learn, let's say the five major tree species or at the end of the quarter, if they can know 15 tree species, the most common ones, I'm really happy. So I have examples of the three I would expect all students to know by the end of the quarter. The top one is a Douglas fir, middle one's a Western red cedar, bottom one's a Western hemlock, right? So when I was designing my assessments, I started asking myself, is it really important that students learn 15 specific tree species? Do I wanna give them a list and say, okay, you have to know these 15. But the problem is not everybody's necessarily gonna have those around their house, right? And I can't tell them to go searching for something that they don't know what it is to begin with. So do I want them to just identify 15 species near their house? Like, is that enough to meet this objective? Or do I care where the species, do I just want them to learn 15 things, right? Am I happy at the end of the quarter if they just have learned to identify 15 things? Uh, like, how do, you, how do you figure this one out? What I did was I ended up asking my students to make a weekly field journal. Um, in my environmental science class, I said, I can't tell them to go find these species. So I asked him to go out each week and make 10 new observations at a field site that was accessible to them. The nice thing about this was they could pick a park. So the student, the one that says week nine, that student ended up going to Mercer Slough. There's another student who did a beach site. And then the top right photo is actually uh, just near Microsoft campus. So there's a little wetland there where a student would go walking. And I did set this assignment up as a tilted assignment. So I gave students an example to follow. And 
you can tell from the bottom two, it kind of looked like, they kind of look the same. They're kind of based off my example, but not everybody followed it. And what I learned is while it's nice to give an example, if you can build in that flexibility, does it have to look exactly like what I wanted? No, it doesn't, okay? Um, because you get some really amazing things. If you let students interpret what you wanted to some degree, if you keep that learning outcome in mind, right? I wanted them to identify some species. I wanted to get them off the computer. I also wanted them to go outside, right? So I have one student who would do this nice design setup. I had another student who printed them up and glued them on a piece of paper and hand wrote them, but also learned the species. And what I like about the top right one is you see somebody else in the picture. So it was clear they were sharing this experience with another person, which was also really important to me. So all of these um, students got credit for correctly identifying the species, whatever that species was. So I actually learned a ton of new species myself because I verified all of their identifications. But they learned how to use um, ID guides. I gave them some resources. They told me about some better ones they were using. And they learned to identify species in their area, even though they weren't necessarily what I would have told them to do if we were in the classroom, learn these um, 15 species. So these are three examples from three different students, but I want to show you, I had a student who emailed me at the start of the quarter and said, you know, I'm not good on the computer. Do you mind if I do a more traditional field journal? And I was like, sure, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. So every week, this student submitted, so this is a weekly journal, this student submitted 20 watercolor paintings of organisms they saw around their houses. And I loved seeing this, like every week, I just wanted to see what else she painted. Right? So is this what I was imagining when I designed my field journal? Not at all. Uh, Jen, you have your hand up. No, I'm just clapping. That's amazing. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. I love her paint. And I asked all the students if I could share these things, just so you know. Yeah, so I have this, they did um, 10 weeks of field journals. So I have, she just painted 200 different organisms as part of this. Right, and I could not ask the students to do this. This is an environmental science class. I can't ask them to paint, but this is what I got. Um, this is at the end of the quarter, I had them write up a species list. I had them throughout the quarter compile a list of what they saw because I wanted them to realize how much they identified. And I had them write a reflection about the experience. But this is from one student. This is her species list from what she observed doing her field journals. And when you're out there, they wouldn't necessarily just do the 10 I asked. Sometimes they do 12, sometimes they do 15, right? But I could not, at the beginning of the quarter, have told a student, you need to learn all these organisms without them really pushing back, right? But if I said, just find 10 new things each week, and this is what a single student came up with. And this student particularly liked plants, so they focused on plants. Other students focused on uh, animals. Um, and I just, this impresses me so much that they saw this much in the spring quarter on their own and they identified it without my help in the most, for the most part. I did have a discussion board where they could post a picture and say, can you help me identify this? But very few students asked for that help. They were able to identify them on their own. I also asked the students to share with me just a two sentence summary of that field journal experience. And I just wanna share a few of them with you. Um, and I'll, I had already wanted to do it, and at the end I'll tell you a second reason why I think this is really important. So um, the first one says, overall, this field journaling experience was incredibly fun and helped me in a lot of ways. I improved my plant and bird ID skills. It got me out of a month long art rut, and it allowed my dad, dog, and I to have some quality time in nature, okay? I'm not gonna read all of them, but I want to point out another one said, uh, especially during these quarantine periods, I only meet other people online, so I rely on the interaction, interaction with the nature around me, so I won't feel lonely, and I could keep my physical and mental health. So this really helps students with that aspect. Another student said, it's extensive and tedious, but also favorite homework. So this was not easy for them. It was actually really challenging for them. And then another one, through these observations, I found a new respect for the green belt behind my house 
It's not an abandoned space in between houses, but a thriving habitat for the displaced wildlife of Fin Hill. So the students in their reflections very much said uh, in the beginning, they were really resistant to doing this, but by the end of the quarter, they really enjoyed it. So that was one way that I assessed, did they learn the species that were around them? But I also allowed them to get outside and away from their computers. Um, I also had the students do weekly readings. And I was trying to figure out how do I get the students, how do I know if they did the readings? Because we know it's really easy to say I did the readings without actually doing them, right? So. I have the students write up a summary of what they read. So this course, by the way, doesn't use a textbook. So I was posting links to sites um, and asking them to read those. So I asked them to read the, to summarize the content and you can tell really by a very quick scan whether or not they actually read the materials. I asked them to connect it to their lives. So it's not just a rote, here's what the text said, here's how it applies to me. And then they got credit for asking a meaty question. And the, just the definition of meaty was, if you can't Google the answer. It can't be how much rainfall does Seattle have each year? And I could use those questions. Sometimes I would answer the questions for students and sometimes other students would read the questions and answer them. Um, I posted these as discussion board posts because I told students, other students will be able to read your summary. So if a student student didn't do it, they couldn't see what was posted, but it actually improved the quality of their, po of their summaries because they knew once they posted it, everybody else would be able to read it. So their summaries were very well written. Um, I was really surprised by how well they did. And they didn't have a length associated with them, and some students wrote really long summaries, like it was just naturally went that way. Uh, so here are some examples just excerpts from the reading summaries of how students would tie it into their lives. So I found the chapters in the Seattle Street Smart Naturalist extremely relatable. Growing up in the Midwest, I've endured weeks of severe weather and currently get frustrated by my neighbor's lack of snow shoveling technique. The section about the Puget Sound convergence zone was eye-opening. As I read, I started remembering all of the times I've driven on I-405, experiencing rain on one end and sunshine on the other. Right? This isn't something a student can cheat on. There's no way somebody else could write it for them, sure. But I could get tell that this student read the text and then read, connected that material back to their own lives. And that's part of what I want to do as a science teacher, right, is make students realize that all of this information does um, affect them personally. The second one, honestly, this is the first time I heard about Seattle being built on the Seven Hills. On my occasional trips to Seattle, I always disliked Seattle in a bad dreamish sort of way. The sparse parking, the cramped parking, and the red light in the middle of the slope always deterred me. Now I see Seattle differently. Um, another reason I really liked having the students tie their readings to their daily lives is this is a way that I connected with my students. I learned a ton about them by reading their summaries. Um, I had another reading I had them do on birding while black, and their we actually did a lab where they went birding and I asked them to relate their experience bird watching from their perspective to what happened to this uh, scientist in the article Birding While Black and how their experience might have been different if they didn't look how they did. And I got some really great responses from students on that as well. So just knowing they're doing the reading, but also making them uh, make it personal really worked well for me. I just want to give you a couple examples of what a meaty question was. So after the doing the readings, students would ask things like, say we were to turn back the clock to before Washington was fully settled and we had the knowledge of environmental impacts and the technologies we have in modern day. How much of the old growth forest do you think could have efficiently been saved? Right, you can't Google that, but it shows me that the student was thinking about the content, thinking about what they read. And if it was in something I knew the answer to, I would go in and answer it for them. Another question, should we treat remaining ancient past massive old growth trees for diseases and parasites as monuments or should we allow nature to take its toll? Again, just showing you that students are thinking about the content and how it relates to what they're seeing or reading around them. 
other instructors who I know use a similar model, what they do is they have the students ask meaty questions and then the next week students are required to respond to one meaty question that another student asked. Um, I didn't do that this quarter, but that's another way to use these questions. So make the next week a student answer them. Um, so I said, I taught my course asynchronous, asynchronously. I also didn't give any exams in either of my courses. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know exams. Uh, I didn't get a single complaint from students about that, by the way, but I did do lots and lots of small stakes assessments. I thought students would complain and my course evaluations, they didn't, which really honestly surprised me because they had a lot of work to do. There's a lot of content. Um, one of the assessments that I would do in marine biology is where students have to identify marine invertebrates. So we do a lot of invertebrate ID. We would go to the beach and, and do field trips and learn about invertebrate ID there. And I just couldn't do that this quarter. So I found an online quiz where students had to identify local marine species. And I asked the students to do the quiz and they just to get full credit, they had to earn a score of 1250. And I did this and it took me about 15 minutes uh, to get to that point. And these are two, and students just submitted a screenshot when they got to 1250. And as you can see, these are two student submissions and they only had to get to 1250, but they went way higher. Um, they did, one student answered 91 questions, one student answered 96 questions. You learn a lot by answering these questions, whether or not you get them correct, right? If you get them wrong, you learn just as much as from an incorrect ID as you learn from a correct ID. And as one student pointed out, I kept going because it's really addicting to uh, keep doing this. So if I had told them to sit down and do, you know, answer 96 questions identifying marine invertebrates, they would have really balked at that. But if I asked them to get to a certain score, it became a game and they were able to do it quite well. So that's another thing that I did. I also took my worksheets and I, I really like this. I do a lot of worksheets in my class. I teach in the flipped classroom already. So I have a lot of worksheets where I teach the students and they answer questions throughout the worksheets. And I took those worksheets and I put them into Canvas quizzes so it's the exact same material I would have done in class, but I just converted into a Canvas quiz. And that allowed me to give students immediate feedback. Because what I didn't want to do is they're going through, they have a study guide, they're answering it, but they're always saying, you know, how do I know if my answers are right? So I could have an explain question. So this, this particular worksheet starts out with an image and they're asked to explain what's happening. And then I could see if they understood the material and they could see before they progressed by at, answering a short multiple choice question. And these, you know, are super quick to grade. Um, none of us like grading online, I think, but these are really fast to grade and I could put in these multiple choice questions and mix them up with open-ended questions to make sure the students were getting the content. And I did this with content that they may have might have already seen, but I want to emphasize that they learned the content. And this allowed me to check. I mean, these are the same questions I would ask on an exam, but now they did it and I feel like if it's something like the short quiz, they're not timed. I tell them they're quizzes. They're really just worksheets in quiz form. Um, they uh, don't get stressed about doing them and they don't feel like there's any reason to cheat on them. I didn't see any evidence that they cheated on them anyway. I also am a really big proponent of having other random things online. Sorry, I keep shifting over with the, the sun through my sun skylight keeps going on me. So I have my students do an art project and this is from marine biology. They had one week where they collected their plastic so they could see how much plastic they were using and then they were asked to use that plastic to create a marine animal. And these are two examples of projects that students made. So again I was so happy to get them off the computer and do something artistic right and they really like this project. It's amazing how much they actually like this project. Um, I also have a lot of discussion or kind of reflection questions in there, but they're short. It's not a really long answer. In my, you know, I don't want you to read all of what's on there, but in my uh, ecology class, at the beginning of the quarter, I asked the students, if you had 
money and you needed to take a piece of land and either turn it into a park or develop it, what would you do and why? And there, that's what kind of these options are. Do you want to save a park and increase your gas taxes? Or do you want to develop the park and pay less to register your car? And in the beginning of the quarter, I just let them answer however they want. But at the end of the quarter, I asked them the same question and said, okay, now can you justify your answer based on the science? Right? You can still have your opinion, but you have to justify your opinion based on the what you learned this quarter. So they had to talk about edge effects and fragmentation of habitats. And they did, they very naturally saw that. So it was a really cool way to see where they were starting and where they got to by the end of the quarter. Uh, and some students said, no, I, I didn't know the reasons why before, but I would still do it. And I have some students who say, I totally changed my mind because now I realize why we need to um, take one tact over the other. And there's no I right mean, answer. Sorry, we, we have around one more minute. Okay. Yeah. Perfect, because it's my last thing. Um, and then my final reflection, I didn't give a final exam, but I gave a final reflection and they had to answer two questions. So I wanted to know, I can improve my course if I know what content was most interesting for them, what activity was most interesting thing for them or why, what did they learn about themselves taking the class, and then I also have added one in about if this is your first time taking an online class, what did you learn that you can use to do better going forward? And this is the way I actually saw how they progressed from the beginning to the end of the quarter. Um, because in their answers, they give you a lot of content. I just want to point out, so I, that originally was my end, but just today, uh, that field journal took on more meaning. So Seattle Public Schools put out a proposal where starting in fall, all K-12 students are going to have two hours a day of outdoor education. So this is from today. Uh, because they recognize that outdoor education is really important for equity. Getting students off the computers and doing things outside. So anything that you can do to encourage that, I really highly support. Thank you so, um, so much, Heidi. Uh, so we have time for around um, two to three questions. So this is the time for question and answer. I don't have any questions, but just a comment. Um, I love the ideas that you presented, Heidi. They're, those are so creative and it makes me want to take your quiz now on identifying the marine invertebrates too, so. <laughs> You can do it. So Kelly, I was thinking of you, again, so for your criminal justice classes, those kinds of discussions fit so naturally where you're like, you know, how do you feel about probation? Right. Okay, well, how do you feel about it now? And can you justify why you did that? And exactly. you can really see if they learn the content. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Very well done, Heidi. Thank you. By the way, both my classes had a B plus average, which is higher than anything I have ever had. I'm usually like dead on a C and very okay with that. So my students did very well with this. Um, so actually, I loved really fast is the fact that you took an individual outcome and you were really, really thoughtful about other ways that you can assess that outcome. So rather than just saying, hey, I'm going to test it or something like that, you, you were really, you thought outside the box. And I think that that's a really good idea for us if we can look at those outcomes and really um, focus on them individually and think what, what could we do that um, gets them out from behind the screen and so forth um, to really engage. And it becomes more memorable, right? They're gonna remember those walks on the beach and walks out in the forest and whatnot. So nice job yep. on that. Thank you. Yeah, I, that would be one takeaway I hope you all get is how can you take what you've been teaching and really re-examine how you measure whether or not students are doing that or how you ask them to do it. Blaze, did you have a question? Yeah, oh, yeah I had a quick question. Oh, sorry. It relates to the grading um, for this. Do you have like a rubric for the various assignments or how do you decide how well the student has done and are you grading a, uh, com, um, like 
uh, comparing the students' work against the, uh, other students in the class, or is there a, a standard scale? Um, no, so I have, I had a rubric for all of the assignments, but usually, I mean, the rubric really was for the readings. If mm -hmm. you mentioned all of the readings, you got the five points. If you didn't mention one of the readings, you got four points if you didn't mention two of them, because there are usually a few. Uh, and then as far as the discussions go, it's, it's usually, did you reach, you know, I say minimum, the students like minimum, so minimum 300 words. Did you meet that? Did you ask, talk about what I asked you to talk about? And just stopped it there. Okay, thanks. Hey, can I ask a logistical question? Yeah. How long did it take you to kind of revamp all your assessments like this? Um, these didn't take that long. Re rewriting the labs is what took much longer. Uh, building the quizzes and things, it's, it's just copy pasting. Because I already have, again, this was a little easier for me because I teach with a flipped classroom. So I have all of these materials. If I had to find them, it would have been a lot worse. But because I have them, it was just putting them into Canvas, which you know takes some time, but not that much. David, can you help your hand raised? Oh yes, uh, Heidi, thank you. Heidi, thank you so much. Uh, so amazing, uh, so interesting. And I love what you shared about the equity piece. Uh, outdoor education promotes that. Uh, uh, I would love to uh, uh, steal, I mean, borrow some of your ideas for my science classes. Thank you so much. And my, you know I'm always happy to share. Thank you, Heidi. And the cafe I'm at right now is uh, actually next to the Mercer Slough. Is that right? Yep. And uh, yeah, so I've never understood what slough was. But uh, I'm just curious, besides the logistics question, um, how did you come up with uh, changing these formatting and you know instead of giving them just a straight on assessment was it talking to others or just uh lots of reflection on your part in terms of uh how did you come up with this, how, the process of, of doing all this so there are two things one is first just lots of reflection on my part and modifying what i already had into this um, setting. The other was all of the meetings, all of the talking I've heard people doing where they're trying to make these multiple choice questions fit the online environment and the conversations about how hard people are working to make it fit and it wasn't working. And I'm like, why are you trying to force this, you know, Allison's been there for these conferences, like I've students have two cameras up and I'm making sure I'm like, but no, just have them do something where it's it's just, it's not worth it to cheat or it's harder to cheat. I don't know, this last, last image is, was drawn by a student, you know, I asked them to redo a diagram because they're learning even from going through that process of making these materials. But yes, mostly lots of reflection, which I do all the time anyway. How can I teach this better? How can I help the students grasp the content better? Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much, Heidi. It was inspirational. I'm gonna apply this to my Spanish class in some way. I love it. Thank and you. I'm always happy. You guys bounce, bounce ideas. Y'all can bounce ideas off of me and I'm happy to take, send me an assignment and say, how can I redo this? And I will happily help you with that.